Right. So this is uh, a piece about uh, surveillance in the... Here we are in 2016 and there are plenty of um, cameras around. Uh, my point is that these cameras are generally not available to normal citizens, which makes me question why we would bother having them. So I've got to look them up here because I've got so many examples of where cameras are completely useless to everybody, um, surveillance cameras that is, uh, that I don't know why we bother with them. So, uh, product placement. Sorry, I don't get paid. I'm just, just makes me feel important. Car parks. People have them in the cars. You know, so you can uh, check on an accident afterward or, or sometimes if they're not in their car parked and there's an accident that happens to their car while they're not in it, which is a common thing I've had anyway. Um, so I'll give these examples of, of what I'm talking about, but the big issue is why do we have the, the, all these cameras around yet your average citizen can't get access to the footage? Now a while back there was this thing where people were supposedly being very difficult, you know, individuals were being difficult and going to um, railway stations and saying, look I waved at the camera. Uh, and I want you to go and find it, this tiny bit of footage where for 10 seconds or something I waved at the camera back in 19, you know, 99, I want you to go and get me the footage. A lot of that seems to have died away. I don't know if that can still happen, but this is, my concern is that even in quite important occasions, on quite important occasions, uh, your average punter cannot get hold of the footage. I call it footage, I mean obviously video material, megabytes, you know, whatever. Um, so I'm going to give these examples and you'll begin to realise um, what it is I'm talking about. The, the first thing I would say straight off the bat is you often see something in car parks especially and the thing that you see is we are not liable or, or we have no responsibility for, we are not liable for any damage to your vehicle howsoever caused. Uh, it's solely at the owner's responsibility. Now you probably think that means if somebody... Um, bashes into your car, that means that Tesco or Asda or Morrison's or whoever aren't going to pay for the damage if you can't find who caused the damage. Um, what it really means is they're not going to lift the finger to help you and you probably don't realise that until you've had an incident. So I'll give these examples but bear that in mind, what they're really doing is completely and utterly getting out of helping you. They will not lift a finger and in some, in some cases they will actively prevent you from finding out what it is that you want to find out from, uh, from that camera footage, camera video material. Right, so I've got seven examples here. Um, first example I'm going to bring up is from a few years back. It's an assault. Uh, there was a night out in Leeds and on this night out there were several people. A couple of the people didn't get on very well, um, you know, this happens. Uh, someone got drunk, uh, that happens too, uh, and it was right beside Millennium Square in Leeds, uh, as it's called now. Now it was a blooming great car park, a dirty great car park, but it's now called Millennium Square and they have ice rinks there and stuff. The point is it's right outside the nightclub. Now the camera that pointed in that car park was not actually owned by the nightclub, but it was owned by the council. This is what I found out from the police later. Now. This is where one problem rolls into another, so I'll just point out there are two clear problems here. First, unfortunately, and you'll realise in a minute, the, the, the gender mattered so hugely during the assault and afterwards to the police <coughs> that it changed everything about it. So I'll tell you what happened. Um, uh, the person who got assaulted walked out of the nightclub because there'd been an altercation and the person who assaulted them started by throwing a drink at them. And this is provocation. This is in front of loads of people, including a couple of bouncers. This is clearly intended that that person will feel provo provoked and, you know, get stuck in. Uh, the person decided not to do that and instead, considering their options, thought, you know what, I'm going to leave. So they left. Um, the person they were with, uh, their partner, also left shortly thereafter. Then, of course, the protagonist, the aggressor, decides that they'll leave because they haven't done enough yet. 
<coughs> so they follow them and it ends up, cut a long story short, they end up punching and kicking both of these people, one of whom was their sister, the protagonist's sister. So it's all on, it's right in front of this video camera outside, one of these big ones, you know, these security cameras, CCTV. And uh, when it got to the police in the end, um, now bear in mind, this is someone who got assaulted, punched, kicked, and someone started by throwing a drink at them. That sounds pretty clear cut. There's witnesses, there's CCTV to look at. Okay, here's the problem. The person who was getting kicked and punched was a bloke. And the person who was doing the kicking and punching and threw the drink on them to try and start it off was a woman. That's the end of that. The police were literally not interested. Um, I suspect even if it involved spilled blood or whatever, they still wouldn't have been interested. That leads you into the next thing. You ask the police to get the footage or where's it come from. They start saying, oh, it's probably owned by the council. It's probably not working. Okay, so that's example number one. One problem rolls into another. They're not interested. They're not going to bother the backside. No footage was ever produced. So that's camera situation one. Situation two, B&Q car park. Um, daylight hours this time. And what we've got in the B&Q car park is there's, uh, I park up. I'm just going in for a 10 minute shop. I know exactly what I want. I'm going in straight out. I park beside, just so happens, a police car. It's the sort of thing that you notice. And I go inside. I come out. A few minutes later, my car, which was red or black at the time, has a big white mark down it on the side where the police car was parked. I'm not saying, or police vehicle might have been a van, I'm not saying they did it, but I am saying in 10 minutes there's not much time for someone else to park, then them to rub your car. Okay. So to, to fix it all, we just need the footage, wouldn't we? The video material, the megabytes. Okay. The file. So I go and ask. Uh, of the service desk. I say, well, you know, I've had a bit of a thing with the car. Uh, any chance you could produce that? Now, unfortunately, I went and mentioned, me being, pardon me, the innocent type, pardon me, I went and mentioned that it was a police vehicle I was beside. And this is unfortunate for two reasons. One, it's near Elland Road. And if you know Elland Road, there's a football, this is in Leeds, in Yorkshire, there's a football stadium just down the road called the Elland Road Stadium by most people. Um, there's a massive police station just right near it, which is handy, I suppose, at times. Um, but that's also very near the B&Q. Um, the service desk man I asked said he'd have a word with management to see if they could procure the video material. What happened in actual practice was, a few minutes later, he's made a telephone call. Lo and behold, police car draws up. I could see it through the doors. I was kind of skulking around waiting to see if he'd went and talked to the manager. And then this cop comes in. And cut a long story short, he has a bit of a confab with a service desk guy, gets handed over a package, which I have to say was in brown paper and about the size of a videotape, and then uh, walks out with it, thanks the guy, goes out, away he goes. I goes up to the service desk guy, I said, uh, have you had a word with management yet? He said, no. I said, that isn't a copper walking out with my video material that I need to prove that it's a police vehicle that scraped my car, is it? And he said... No, it's something else entirely. It's none of your business. It's police business. Right? That's what the B&Q person said. And that is the classic case of we do not, we are not liable in any way, shape or form. It's all on you. Your responsibility completely is yours for any damage to your car. Right? That's what they mean. We won't lift a finger to help. And not only that, we'll helpfully call, for example, the police and let them know there's a tape here that if they don't come collect it, might be using evidence against them. Okay? That's what happened. Uh, third example, another B&Q car incident, right? I'm reversing, trying to get out of this parking space. I've just sort of got in the car and started driving around because I had quite a big black car at the time, big Citroen XM. And this other guy in a biggish Rover decides he's going to start coming out. He's obviously feeling very impatient. It was difficult for me to move partly because he had moved his car three feet out. So there's no room for manoeuvre. So eventually I'm, I think, well, you know, I could give way to him, I suppose. Then he starts reversing. I thought... He's going to try and hit me now. He's actually going to have an incident in order to to do what? I don't know. I could see what he was going to do. So I immediately put the parking brake on, turned the engine off and just sat and waited. 
clunk, the guy hits the back of my car. I gets out and I looks at him and he looks at me and he said, oh, well, that's a bit of a shame. And I said, well, it's all your fault, mate. And he said, no, it's 50 feet. I said, no, mate, no, no. I was sat there, parking brake on, engine off. You reversed into me. Pfft. Right? Now, the guy was, unfort- he realised he was in the wrong. I said, look, I'll tell you what, mate, you're obviously in a hurry. I'll pull in and I'll let you have your selfish way and you can just drive on to your important appointment. And the point is, I didn't even bother going for the tape that time because I already knew from experience what happens. That's third time. Tape either not available, no use, or I'm so put off, I'm just not going to even bother doing it. It's a relatively minor thing. Okay. Number four. Assault. This was somebody who I knew, a female employee. It was on Manchester Road. There's a small business there. There's rows of shops and stuff. There's a small business there. Run at a time by an army officer. I'm not saying all army officers are like this. But they can be a bit full of themselves. And this ex-army officer... He runs this business, he's kind of boss of it, it's his own little business. And this woman I knew, uh, he was kind of getting a little bit too cosy stroke sexual harassment in this tiny little office they got. So she it sort of fled the scene as it were. So anyway, the story I heard was they fled the scene, they ran across this car park, which happens to be a working men's club. And there's a camera there. Uh, the guy though reacquired her in that car park. So you get the situation where, having got away from him, uh, she's now reacquired, he grabs her by the arm, and then some sort of argument goes on. Ended up, she called me and asked me to come and collect her. Which I did, and um, she she was kind of in hiding. She'd gone into a... she got a lift with somebody, or she'd gone into a, a, a little chef or something. Anyway, I went and collected her, and I got the story. I said, look, okay, okay. And it was... she left because of this. Right, so she's kind of in a sexual harassment situation and she says, look, I'm not going back. I said, okay, I sure, I said, is it that bad? And she obviously felt it was, so I thought, well, who am I to keep on about it? So I said, okay, so how much money are you owed? She said, well, I'm not going back for that. I said, well, I'll tell you what, you don't have to. I'll go back. I said, I'll ask in the politest possible way, but firm, she's owed such and such and I'll have it, thanks. So I went, uh, I rang up the guy, Organised it, I went over. Um, The thing is, I did get the money in the end, but I'd gone to the Working Men's Club to get the video material. And they did have a tape. And he looked through it and he said, yeah, this is for that time. I said, all right. He took ages to get it. Ages. It was a couple of guys behind the bar who were doing beer kegs and stuff at the time. It was about the afternoon or something. I don't know what day it was. So he disappears for maybe 25 minutes. He comes back, he gives me the tape. I said, all right, I'll, I'll have a look at it, I'll copy it, and then I'll come back to you. He said, no, no, I don't need a bag. He says, take it away, it's all right. I thought that's very generous of him. Okay, I gets back, puts it in the tape machine, and all you get is, it's perfectly good reproduction of the car park, nothing happening, a few cars here and there, beer, lorry draws up, that sort of stuff. And the exact 25 minutes or 20 minutes, whatever, that we needed was snowed out. Then it comes back on again and there's the empty car park. And the time date stamp is there. They basically spent the 20 minutes to keep me waiting, wiping the particular bit I needed. That's a sexual harassment situation. That's quite serious. And the working men's club has gone and wiped it. Now, either that's so they don't get involved in the court case, or maybe they knew the guy. I have no idea. But what I know is, that's my fourth example of quite a serious incident where you can't get a hold of the video footage. They've wiped it. It's a kind of, I don't know if you call it a conspiracy, but everyone's in the same game, preventing you from getting it. Okay, example five. Uh, Council Sports Centre Car Park. Usual thing. Uh, the owner of the car, brand new car, they're inside uh, playing badminton or doing aerobics or Zumba or whatever it is. They come out to their car after two hour long sessions, that's two hours, and somebody in a cream coloured car has gone and scraped the corner of their beautiful red car and left this creamy colour right on the corner at the back. It's near side rear. So, pretty nasty. Um, They've done it, pushed off, 
it's a bit too serious to me that they've done it and walked away. And there's another reason why, because it looks to me like the way it went, the paint strips that way and then it doesn't go any further. I've got a feeling they didn't scrape along. I've got a feeling where it, and they thought, bloody hell, this is bad. And then they've reversed out. There's something damn funny about it. Anyway, I've looked around the town for creamy coloured cars and I've found one, a Mini, that has got the exact scrape mark in what looks pretty close to the position to me. Back to the cameras. Um, not working. The sports centre is going to shut and the cameras aren't working. Some splitter devices, they call it, that flips from one camera to the other, stop working and don't work. They tried to point me somewhere else, I said, oh, that's great. Yeah. So, not working camera. Uh, number six, personal injury situation. Seacroft, in, on the outskirts of Leeds, there's a big shopping centre, and round the back you park your cars. There's a barrier that is automatic, your car comes along, barrier senses the car, whips up. I am thinking about stuff, I don't know where it is, but I'm walking along. A car has gone through and the barrier has gone up. And I'm talking to somebody over there, someone I'm there with, they're walking that way, I'm walking this way. Clunk, barrier comes down right on my head. It bloody hurt. Right? With my previous experience, I didn't even bother asking for the video material. Because you're going to ask the people that own the place for video material that will incriminate them so that they can, you can then take them for a personal injury claim. Forget it. Now that was head splitting. When that barrier dropped, believe me, they're a lot heavier than they look. Now they could do all sorts of things about it, but what I couldn't do, what I didn't feel I was able to do, was to get from them the footage that I would use against them for personal injury. So that's an issue right there. Uh, number seven. Seven examples. This is over a, a 20 year period, and this is, this is an example here. Motor vehicle accident. Busy junction, I was in a motor vehicle. There are three lanes on this road that I'm going to join. Two lanes are going that way. So there's a normal lane going that way, and there's a normal lane going this way, and this extra lane that's going that way is a filter lane, okay? So imagine you get two lanes as normal road, but in the middle, there's a filter lane to, lane to come here. I'm in my car, and I want to get out and turn right. Quite a difficult manoeuvre at that time of day at that junction in Leeds. Cut a long story short, I managed to jump, as it were, into a blank spot in the filter lane, which is totally allowed chevrons. If no vehicle is there, if it's clear to do so, you may enter and park on the chevroned area temporarily while trying to get off into traffic, okay? I know this because I read the highway code afterward, but I did do the right thing. Indicated, zoomed out, waited there because there's another load of traffic. Some guy comes along, some absolute tool. He'd been parked at the side, it turns out, on a double yellow, <laughs> didn't indicate before he pulled out that's why I didn't see him I just thought his car was parked I, I'm there in the middle lane he comes along and for some reason he deviates from his lane moves over to the middle lane going the wrong way down the filter lane and crashes into my stationary vehicle now this is not somebody emerging from a junction and getting hit by a car on the main thoroughfare this is somebody who has emerged from the junction already done parked in the middle stationary with the engine running in the middle lane of the, the, the road and waiting their turn to go. And this guy comes along smacks right into me. To move it on, it turns out that right opposite this junction, there's a company which has a video camera permanently trained on this junction. Now you can go into why they've got that. Literally, I was in the office because the guy showed me in because he hoped this would make me admit to it being my fault, which it isn't. So... They got this office and this video camera on the tripod pointing down at that junction. And I figured it out later. The guy who hit me was going to visit that firm, so he had to cross over the road. I'm shown in the, in the video footage as sitting right there in the middle. I am correctly stationary, waiting my turn to move into the other line of traffic. This guy has to change lanes in order to hit me, and he had a dog. And what I suspect is, I, I now know he had just picked up the dog from his sister's who's just there where he'd parked. He had the dog either in the front of the car or the dog was a nuisance. His attention was gone. He looked back for a minute in that second or few seconds. I've moved the middle. 
He's gone, moved over, crunch, the accident's happened, and they tried to make me say it was my fault because they said, well, you're the one leaving the junction. I said, no, no, I'd already done that. I was stationary in this lane. If it's clear to do so, you may sit in that lane and wait for your turn to get out. If that guy had carried on, basically, in his lane, he wouldn't have hit me. Okay. In the 18 months of wrangling that followed that incident, and my car was written off, in effect. I sold it for 250 quid for parts. In the 18 months of wrangling, at no point did I manage to get the video footage. So I only saw it because the company owner tried to get me to admit it was my fault, which it wasn't. He tried to do that, and that's the only reason I ever saw that video footage. In conclusion then, seven examples over a 20 year period where you have no ability whatsoever to get a hold of the video footage. I say this, if the average citizen cannot get access to, after an incident of some sort, not just because you feel like it, but after an important incident, we're talking about sexual assault in some cases, sexual harassment. We're talking about motor vehicle accident where two vehicles were written off. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about personal injury where a massive plank of wood drops on someone's head. If you cannot, for one reason or another, or are massively discouraged from so doing, obtain that footage, that video megabyte material, if you're not able to get that file, what use is it to the average citizen? And if it's not any use to the average citizen, I think all this business of the elite being able to access it, I think that's all a bit questionable. Uh, there's one more example here, number eight, which is where um, someone decided that I was guilty of fly tipping. Uh, what I actually did was I went into the town hall because my bin had not been collected several occasions and I dropped the bagged rubbish that was, the dry bagged rubbish that was in my bin into the town hall foyer and then I left. Now, I never denied it was me, but I did ask them what date and time it was. And what's noticeable is when they produced finally, and it took a while, when they produced the footage, the video material from the camera of that foyer, there was no time and date stamp. Now, I only pled guilty to this, because not because I was guilty, because I wasn't guilty of fly tipping. Fly tipping, to me, is a lorry in the dead of night with a load of toxic waste onto a farmer's field. You don't go in broad daylight with a freaking great wheelie bin and drop that into a foyer in the town hall where you're pretty sure there is a camera. That's not fly tipping, that's a protest, which is what it was. Anyway, because a duty solicitor, and here's my tip, never trust a duty solicitor. The solicitors who are on hand if you don't have your own legal help when you go to magistrate's court, they're there to make you plead guilty if they can, and so never trust them. I was just concerned about my family's sports day or I would never have pled guilty. I just wanted out in time to be at the sports day. So they threatened me with a year's imprisonment for this and all sorts. Anyway, the point is, this camera was paid for with terrorism, anti-terrorism money. And what does it get? It, it, it gets a bloke who's been doing empty doing his protest. Is that the purpose for which that camera was bought? And should the data from it be used for that purpose? And if it is to be used, how come it's so hard to get a hold of by the person that they're prosecuting? How come it doesn't have a date timestamp? You know, the questions go on. Basically, it's all one-sided. The elite, the government and other agencies all club together and they get the use of the footage when it suits them for prosecution purposes. Joe Soap, forget it. Joe Public, no, 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 no. It's not for your benefit. That's the supermarkets talking. That's some guy behind the bar that runs the working men's club security system talking. That's B&Q. That's the police talking. Pfft, the councils. You know, is it worth having all these cameras? Can they justify it when only they can get access to it when it suits them? And I say they shouldn't and they can't. Thanks for watching and listening.